Hi everyone, it's Tuesday and it is cup of KT time. Um, I hope you've all had a chance to put the kettle on and um, gone and made a very nice cup of tea for yourselves or grabbed um, a cup of coffee if that's more what floats your boat on a day like today. It's a pretty overcast day in Sydney today. We seem to be experiencing the absolute highs and um, a few <laughs> of the quieter days as well. So, but it's all good because so many amazing things are happening. Um, I am super excited this morning by the person that we're going to get to talk to because she's somebody that I have long admired and have had on my list of somebody that I hope I would meet. So I'm very grateful that she's agreed to have a cup of tea with me this morning. Um, that person is the amazing Catherine Fox. So Catherine Fox is a local to our electorate. She's an award-winning journalist and author and authored I think one of the most important books um, in the last 10 years, that being Stop Fixing Women. What an extraordinary concept to actually <laughs> ask people to consider. Um, so as I said, Catherine is from our local electorate and she's very kindly agreed to join me this morning. So I'm just going to find her on our feed um, so that I can bring her in. Mm, I can see she's here. I just have to work out how to let her in. You've got to love. Here we go. I'm getting better at this technology thing, guys. Thank you. Thank you for being so patient with me. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Catherine. What will we ever do if, like, once we meet each other at a coffee shop, like the good old days? <laughs> Nice, wouldn't it? Um, it would be so good. It would be, be so nice. good. I've just been to my local Art Harmon Cafe, which is frequented by the marvelous Nikki Hutley and other fantastic Art Harmon residents. And uh, it's um, it's just it's been open clearly during lockdown, but I do feel this palpable sense of relief. So um, it is it is nice, isn't it? I mean, not that I'm running out and going to uh, any crowds, but yeah, it's it's an interesting feeling, isn't it? I sort of, I almost feel like it must be like what a groundhog feels like when they first start to stick their head up above the ground when, during the seasonal change. Yep. It's like, is it safe to come out? Is my shadow falling? Which way is it going? So I think it's, um, um, thank you so much for making the time to talk to me this morning. As I, I don't know if you heard the preamble, but I actually, it's a real honour for me to meet you. I think the work that you've done and the commentary you've done during your career is, um, it's just been so important. And so thank you for making the time this morning to chat to me and everyone here oh it's a pleasure and congratulations by the way um oh thank you it's women like you who um really are such an inspiration <laughs> it's uh, fantastic to see you step up and this is this is not an easy thing to do and i mean i think we're all aware of that but um good on you thank you thanks Catherine. and actually maybe that's a nice segue then for us to start because i think you know obviously you know, I'm, I'm a child of the 70s. Yeah, I was born in the 70s. So I was very fortunate to have a lot of really strong women around me growing up who were extraordinary role models in terms of resilience and stoicism and capacity to get stuff done. Um, and I think I grew up with this idea that, you know, equality was something that was inevitable and was bound to happen, at least in my lifetime. And then now as somebody who's had 30 years in business and had a multitude of experiences when it comes to sitting on boards where you're the only female or, you know, trying to have a management conversation where you're the only female in the room. How much has, how much has changed and where are we when it comes to this big question of equality, gender equality in Australia? Um, well, I think the short answer is we're certainly not where many of us expected we might be. Um, I'm certainly not a Pollyanna, but I am an optimist. And I think having followed this area for such a long time, I did assume we'd have made a bit more progress, um, but I'm also fully aware that the, the history of the women's rights movement is two steps forward and one back. Um, and I think that while there've been real triumphs along the way, um, I think it is disturbing. And we had a conversation, North Sydney conversations recently, um, and Liz Broderick was pointing out some of the dire uh, situations around the world. Um, I think uh, keeping in mind that I think fairness, uh, gender, equity is not a relative concept. I think it, it applies everywhere. Um, 
I still think that we should expect more in a well-educated and affluent society like ours. So I think that while we've made some great inroads, um, that it's certainly the idea that women can be earners and continue to work and be in paid work. It's not the only goal, but that they can continue to do that for most of their lives is sort of technically accepted. Uh, but the practical um, building blocks that allow that to happen, um, particularly in a self-funded retirement sort of system, um, are just not there. So it's like saying to uh, half the population, yes, technically these doors are open. Oh, but that, yeah, no, that's going to be really hard for you. So it's like one, one hand tied behind the back the whole time. So we're still expected, social expectations are still there around women being, um, you know, the carers, the people who run the house and so on. Um, and that's a really heavy expectation, particularly during COVID, uh, where we've had the triple shift emerge. Um, and uh, goodness, I'm watching my neighbours with kids and thinking, I have to tell you very selfishly, oh, thank God. <laughs> I had three kids, three kids under three. So the very thought of not being able to get them out the door to school uh, is horrifying to me. So my hat's off to all parents. <laughs> Uh, for what you've been doing. Um, but I think that we've still got that very strong sort of social expectation and uh, and yet in so many ways our society expects us to use our education, um, which is reasonable, return on investment, uh, but that hampers us. So I think um, the other thing I just have to say about Australia and a former colleague of mine who now writes for Bloomberg wrote a very interesting article recently and she said that one of the um, the cultural sort of cause of inequity in this country is the whole very masculine idea of mateship and so on. And I think we do have some specific cultural stumbling blocks as well. And we know that because we've dropped down the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index. We're now at 70. This is unbelievable. We used to be 16. So how can this country, with all its many advantages, be at number 70? Uh, it's, it's really disturbing. So is that kind of, it's interesting because I think I saw the head, somewhere I saw a headline yesterday, which was um, that our Premier had declared it a frost, frost for freedom day. And then I saw this lovely comment from actually, and it was a woman, I guess it could have just as easily been a male, but she came out and said, actually, I'd love to be there, but I'm still homeschooling. <laughs> you know, like it was that. So I kind of, it's interesting because I know, and I, you know, all through my life, I've been um, fortunate in that I've always been very ambitious and I've always believed, you know, I was raised to believe that what you wanted to do, you could do. But I have found as a woman that it, what you just commented is true. You know, like you you can be, as I was, the managing director of a multinational PR firm in Australia, but at the same time, I still had three kids under five and a house and food and, you know, I was lucky I had a, a supportive partner, but it was still really, really hard. My question, do you think, are, are we our own worst enemies as women? How much do we have in terms of responsibility to bear here? Uh, no, we are not our own worst enemies. Um, let me be absolutely clear about this. And I've spoken about this on many occasions and actually had some real sort of penny dropping moments from women, uh, mainly. Mm -hmm. um, how can we be? Uh, the, the things that are stopping us from getting ahead are very masculine constructs. So I'm using that in its broadest sense. I'm not saying every yep. single man and I'm, yeah, I'm just talking about the way our society is organised. Um, if we were our own worst enemies, we'd have way more power to be actually able to stymie each other. Um, and the other part of that, um, Kylie, which I also really want to strongly reinforce is this concept that women are sort of almost naturally uh, disposed to stabbing each other in the back as well, to stymieing each other. So absolutely no evidence of that. And certainly no more than men. I, I worked in a national newsroom. Um, I can't even begin to tell you the backstabbing that went on amongst the blokes. Um, yeah. so what we do is uh, we expect women to be nicer and we expect them to be better. And then we beat them up. Oh, my goodness, we beat them up if they fail or make a mistake. So, um, no, we're not our own worst enemies. Would that we had the power to be so. Um, we simply aren't in charge. Uh, so when I look at organisations, which clearly is my, my particular area of interest, workplaces, um, overwhelmingly run by uh, white middle-aged men, overwhelmingly in this country, um, worse again than many of the other OECD countries, um, so if they're the people in charge, how can we be the ones who are stymieing each other? And just quickly on ambition, there's absolutely no evidence, uh, certainly earlier in life, that girls have any different uh, levels of ambition to boys. None. 
um, ambition. We've been told that forever. And the reason that obviously many of us stumble around that word uh, and don't want to own it is we get beaten up for it. So an ambitious woman has been as assertive and aggressive. Um, a man's just behaving in the way that is expected. So again, huge double standards um, and expectations. And also something I often say to women, just remember, you kind of can't win this. So you'll say that I want to do the job and I want to be promoted, um, but then you'll get people sort of implying you're not a good mother and so on. So we have these ridiculous um, ideas. One of the good things, Kylie, just to jump ahead a little bit, is watching young women like uh, Brittany and, um, and Grace Tame and so on, Brittany Higgins, um, from earlier in the year, and Chanel Contos, who have really stepped up and said mm -hmm. workplace sexual harassment or sexual harassment more generally is not acceptable. Um, and these young women are, are really pushing back on the whole idea that there's, there should be any kind of, any concept of victim blaming. Um, yeah. And they're very outspoken, incredibly articulate, um, and they do give me real hope for the future. So I think that some of those good old-fashioned 70s feminist messages that people like me at uni were sort of saying, this is where we need to go, I think some of that's actually landed in a generation that are now in their 20s. I think that's a real sign for optimism, I think. Uh, they, they have a very different way of viewing uh, the world, um, and they're not taking a step back on some of that. So all credit to them. Gosh, I hope you're right. Because actually, Catherine, yeah. two, two things that you've just said that, you know, resonate with me really strongly. I actually, in one of my not too distant past roles, um, we were involved in a situation on the board and business where there was some, um, there was an agreement around what was the best way to kind of move forward. So as CEO, I was, I was advocating and actually I um, had the experience of being described as aggressive you're being too aggressive in the board meeting and i was like actually i think i'm just being assertive and i like i'm making my point and really trying to say this is why i believe it so is that assertion or aggression um and i think you know that was something i can actually honestly say i look i'm very grateful for all the career opportunities i've had and i've done some amazing things um but along the way i've certainly experienced that as being a female md in that environment you know where people would go well but how can you attend that meeting where's you know what what's who's gonna look after your baby or you know what, what's gonna go on but actually really interestingly and and i I'm even stepping up to do this campaign. I have more than once been asked, but what about your kids? What about, you know, your, your three kids? How are they going to cope and how are you going to handle your family? And I guess, so that brings to me to, you know, what, what do we need to do differently? Like, you know, how do we reshape this conversation? Because I agree with you. I think what I find fascinating, and actually I even felt it, I think you come out as a young woman and you believe your world is the oyster and you've had an education which is on par and standard. But then for me it was the years in working that kind of started to teach me that, no, it wasn't the same yeah. for everybody. So that's, what do we do differently? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I always said um, I was an early... Um, sort of convert, to, if you like, to the cause. I, I think it was my Catholic upbringing, to be honest. Thank you, Catholic Church, and I don't usually say that. Um, <laughs> however, um, Liz Broderick talks about late-onset feminism, and she says it's often the case. It's once you're in the workplace, certainly when you're getting a little bit more experience, you suddenly realise that that bloke next to you just seems to be edging ahead. Um, and certainly once uh, parenting comes into uh, the mix, that's where yeah. a lot of women become quite politicised about it um, and gobsmacked a bit too, which is mm. it's kind of, you know, I always say, look, if that's come as a shock to you, there's, then something has been going right because up until then you've actually thought, yes, it's an even playing field. Sadly, that's not the case. It absolutely mm. is not the case. Um, and by the way, just before this, you know, I don't want it to sort of devolve into a... Stereotypes are equally pernicious for men and women. And one yes. of the stereotypes we've talked about for women, but one of the ones for men that I think we still haven't tackled or talked about is that we tell very young men, it's going to be, you're going to be the primary earner. Mm. Um, so that responsibility rests on your shoulders. So, boy, mm. you better be serious about work. Um, mm. Now, my message to my three daughters was always, you are responsible for yourself, mentally, physically, uh, financially, for your life. Yeah. Like, must think like that. No one's going to rescue you. 
Um, yeah. you, you absolutely have to be. And I think, um, in fact, we need to give that message um, to, to all young people. Uh, but, but this emphasis that we place on a very traditional masculine model is, is unfortunate. Okay, what do we do? Well, I make as much trouble as I can. Um, I say that partially, jokingly, but, but not. I've, I've got to a point, I've got some credentials in this area. And when I can, I always say, try and be a circuit breaker. In your, own, in your community, um, as well as in your formal workplace, so be it. I mean, I run into um, not only sexism, but ageism all the time. You know, lockdown here. Um, and <laughs> the number of times I get these unbelievable sorts of behaviour in shops and so on from blokes. Um, and yes, I do come back. As my daughters always say, they never realise who's walked in, do they? <laughs> so I think it's really important to pick up on it. Your point about being seen as um, aggressive in a meeting, sometimes just a little... Would you say that about a man? Can yeah. be an important circuit breaker. Or when someone says something, again, in whatever context, racist, sexist, whatever, uh, Jamila Risby always says, just get, just lean forward and say, I'm sorry I didn't hear that. Could you repeat it? Yeah. Really <laughs> good, I know. Line. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, I, have a few, I have a few of these up my sleeve. I do think we have to speak up and we have mm. to draw attention to the fact that we're still making these assumptions. Um, one of the things, though, Kylie, I did quite enjoy, nasty old me, was when um, the journos started asking the new premier how, who was going to look after, was he going to have enough time with his kids? All six of them. Um, yes. You know, absolutely fair cop. Let's stop always concentrating on women uh, in this context. Um, let's be quite clear that parenting is a joint project, usually, um, and uh, that, that that indeed is something that we need to start talking about differently. Um, Organisations that are taking taking a step forward in this are very much looking at making parenting something that is extended to certainly to blokes and and to women. So I think that I think that those steps are important on a grander scale. Uh, we need to be much more formal and intentional about what we do with policy. Um, we need to make uh, we need to sort out childcare. It's just yeah. an expensive, expensive, inaccessible mess. Um, we need to look at the tax system. So they, I know these are big things, but we also need to take up Kate Jenkins' excellent 55 recommendations from her report. That was an exhaustive piece of work, uh, brilliantly put together. They're very practical recommendations and all of them need to be um, adopted. Um, yeah. So there are a whole lot of things that we can do. Um, and the the other thing I'd say, just on an optimistic note, uh, very interested to watch how the Gender Equality Act in Victoria pans out. So those mm. of you, um, it's certainly in our locale, may not be quite as conversant with it, but um, Dr Nikki Vincent, who's the Gender Equality Commissioner there, who's a brilliant woman, um, I interviewed her earlier in the year as it was just coming in, and uh, there's, some very, there's a very interesting template there. So there's quite a lot that we can do. Um, and by the way, that applies to all public sector employees in Victoria, which is about 11% of the workforce so there's some there's some great stuff that we can do reporting um naming and shaming and so on so um yeah and we have boosted by the way the number of women on asx 200 boards it was eight percent in 2009 when a bunch of us kept writing about it in the fin review um and it's now 33 there are well and actually that's that's a nice segue because i was going to ask you about women in leadership like I, do, what do you think about the idea of quotas when it comes to parties and senior positions? Um, no problem at all. Um, if, if we genuinely believe, and I hate the word merit, um, I mentioned the other night, you know, a friend told me years ago it stands for mates elevated regardless of intellect or talent. That's, <laughs> that's the meaning of merit. Um, that, but, but if you genuinely believe the talent and capacity is, is right across the population, then why, why would you have an objection? The problem that we have with voluntary regimes um, and the business community here has always said, we'll do it voluntarily. And some of them, to be fair, have. But they yeah. tend to be the larger companies that are more scrutinised. When you get beyond the ASX 200, much less into privately owned um, organisations. It's very difficult. So, you know, quotas... Um, the, the upshot from all the research around the world, quotas don't uh, erode uh, merit, uh, whatever you like to call that. Um, they actually enhance it because you get to choose from a wider spectrum of people. Um, the only people who tend to lose out, and there's a famous, famous Swedish study about this, the only people who tend to lose out are mediocre men. <laughs> okay. um, but if you actually gen genuinely want to make the most of people, 
uh, and people's expertise, their education and so on, then a quota or target is an excellent way of ensuring that we have action. Well, it, it's interesting, you know, because I've, I've been a long time supporter of quotas and I fi I've found myself in a number of arguments over the years with people both, you know, commercial sector and other sectors about the relative merits of it. And I think my attitude around it was all, has always been, yes, in an ideal world, it wouldn't be required, like it really wouldn't. But sometimes you need a disrupting factor to come into your society to tip the balance and then when everything readjusts, it settles and it becomes the norm. We already have quotas. We use them yeah. all the time. It's only when yeah. they're applied to gender that we get an allergy and break out in a rash. We have quotas, the Liberal National Party, the Deputy Prime Minister is always from the, the, the junior partner. We have lots of geographic quotas. We don't do it because we want to stymie people. We do it because we want to be fair and we yeah. want to ensure fairness. So when it's applied around a geographic spread, yes, we'll have someone we're based in New South Wales, we'll have someone from Victoria. No one cries out and says, no, that's going to undermine merit. <laughs> we have quotas all over the place and we, and we always have. So our political system is built on having representation from around Australia. That's a quota. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good point. Good point we'll make. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to play this back and then I'm going to memorise that phrase that you just used and when the next person <laughs> raises it with me, I'm going to give them the... the the comeback. Um, thank you so much for your time this morning, Catherine. I know this kind of session is designed that people can listen to us while they enjoy their cup of tea. And often by the 20 minute mark, I'm mindful they're either running out of their coffee or their tea or it's getting a bit cold. But thank you so much. I mean, what I've heard from you today is that there really is a lot of reason to be optimistic. There are a number of things that we can continue to do as human beings, not just men and women, but it is about the actions we take day to day in terms of almost giving people the opportunity to hear the way they're speaking. So that did, I didn't hear you is actually to me a beautiful way of saying, are you listening to yourself? Um, I think also that piece, that very important piece that you said around policy and policy development and legislative change um, is really important. And then just the, the realisation that things are moving and, yes, we might be in this kind of... Sometimes, to me, it feels like it's quite a tense time in our society, Catherine, because it feels like there's it's that final push. But I'm reticent to say it because I know the final push has been discussed in so many generations. That, um, But as a mother of a son... I should say, so I have three children, one son and two daughters. You know, I watch him and I have hope as well because I think he just sees his sisters as people as well. You know, there's not that, at this stage, that gender difference between them. Well, that and that's good to hear. Um, I don't have sons, but I have two excellent brothers um, and I had a father. I mean, we live in a society that is co-ed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't have to do everything. That we'll be split. It's a very crude sort of way. But just finally, Kylie, I think the, the point about this is, and it's not spoken about in polite company, this is about power. It is yeah. about sharing power. Um, and this is why there is fierce resistance to it. So for those uh, listening in today, um, you're not making it up. Um, there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on around women and, mm. oh, you know, it's not that bad. Um, the data that I look at, and I look at it all the time, um, shows, no, no, there is still huge resistance uh, to really basic measures for women. Um, the, the good thing is we can change it. And the other thing to say is it can be changed quite quickly if there is a will to do so. So I think that that's important to remember. And when I look at people like you, I have even more hope that that will happen. Oh. Well, when I look at people like you, I feel inspired to step up and do it. So thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Actually, and I'd love to have another coffee with you one day to talk about some of those numbers, because I think, yeah. you know, often people go, oh, it's not real. Prove it. And I think having someone like yourself to actually go, well, no, actually, here are the numbers, guys. You know, this is how it stacks up would be. I've got you know, all of it. I, the only thing I would say about that is it, it's really interesting because we've been told for years to make the business case. Business case has been made hundreds of times. We have all the data. We have the evidence. It's not about that now. It's about. Oh, I love that. It's about mental. Yeah, it really is. We have the data. We know that. So, yeah. So, but on we go with the good fight. 
<laughs> well, and actually on that note, I will, because one of the things that I think is endemic in our federal government at the moment is that we're not making good business decisions. You know, there are bad business decisions being made, whether it comes to our climate policy, whether it comes to our forward-focused economy, whether it comes to integrity, our politics. And so I think the point that you've just made there around gender equality is a brilliant one to end on. It's just bad business to not have a society where every individual is able to be the best they can offer. So that's perfect. Thank you, Catherine. You would have thought we'd scripted that, but we didn't. That's lovely. <laughs> Thanks for having um, me, Cardi. Oh, no, thank you for your time. And I hope everyone who tuned in today really enjoyed that. Like, as I said, um, Catherine is an extraordinary woman who's done lots of writing. She's an award-winning journalist and also an author of five books, including Stop Fixing Women. Um, I would encourage you, if you've not read those, to get out there and, and buy one and consider the conversation for yourself amongst your own family and your friends. You know, what role are each of us playing in addressing this to make sure Australia is the absolute best country it can be moving forward, not just in the next 50 years, but actually in this next term of government. So that's great. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, See you, Catherine. everyone. Bye. Authorised by Kylie Tink, North Sydney, New South Wales.